Greetings, church. We're going to begin our time of worship with uh, scripture reading. So this one comes from Psalm 96. Verse 2 says, Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we bless your name this morning. Thank you for the gift of our salvation. Um, Lord, you are so worthy of all our praise. Uh, we praise you because you are great, and we revere you because you are great. And we just ask that uh, you would be highly exalted in this time. Um, we honor you, and we love you, and we pray all these things in your name. All right, church, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your constant love. Um, thank you for loving us faithfully, despite us being a people that sometimes fails to love you. 
Um, God, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, and showing us how to live and to love through him. And I pray that his display of love would result in transformation in our lives. Um, God, we give you all the glory and praise, and we continue to worship you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. The Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He would give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss! The Father turned His face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulder Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to another Sunday morning. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, your week and are able to worship the Lord this morning with us. Uh, last week, if you remember, we talked about God's reply to Job in part, and it was really answering two questions. The first question was, is God worthy of our devotion if we don't get anything from him? In other words, if we, have no, if we see no benefits that we're receiving from God, is he worthy of our worship? And then the other question that Job is answering is, is God just? And today we're going to look at the uh, rest of the speech of God uh, in chapters 38 through 40, part of 42. So obviously we're not going to look at all of those verses. But um, I just to kind of remind everybody and keep everybody up to date, or if this is the, if this is the first that you've been watching with us, um, we have to remember that even though Job was going through all of these different sufferings uh, in different areas of his life, the main problem that he was dealing with was theological in nature. Uh, in his mind, the righteous should not suffer. And in his mind, the evil should. But he was a righteous man who was suffering, so for him theologically, everything was turned upside down. He wasn't just complaining against God about the sufferings that he was experiencing, but he was looking at the world as if it had been turned upside down, that there was no more order to things, that God was doing things randomly or unpredictably. And he saw as he looked out into the world, he saw the evil prospering and he, a righteous man, suffering. And so he said, hey, the world's in chaos. 
Uh, there's no order to it. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And because of that, uh, you know, I prefer just that God take me home, that I die. And that uh, after all this chaos has passed in the world, that then I would be raised again from the dead. Well, last week we looked at Job chapter 38, verses 1 to 38, where God begins to address Job, and he speaks about inanimate creation, that is, non-living creation. And he began to show Job how little he understands about the world and how finite his power is in relationship to God. And so, of course, this applies to us as well. You know, we weren't there, God said, when the world was created. Even though we live in this world, we experience the world every day of our lives since we were born, we still do not understand how the world was made and how God did all of that. We were never at the gates of death. We have never been into the recesses of the deep. We have never seen the storehouses of the snow or the rain. And all of these things God has seen. And then our power, of course, is so much more limited than God. None of us have ever commanded the sun to rise in the morning or the rain to fall at a particular time or the lightning to hit its mark. Those things are impossible for us. None of us have ever put the doors on the uh, ocean to keep it within its boundaries. And yet God has done all of these things. And and God is showing Job and he's showing us that um, we know so little and our power is so small that we really have no possibility of interpreting the hidden wisdom of God as it takes place and works itself out in our lives and in the world around us. Uh, So this is a problem that God is dealing with, but he's also going to be dealing with the problem of Job uh, calling into question his justice. Well, today we're going to look at animate creation and God's relationship to the living world. And... um, The fact that God is in control of all of these places in the world that mankind looks as untamable or wild or chaotic, that even these things are under the control of God. And so because of this, God is going to stretch Job's understanding of the world and the way that God works and the way that uh, this suffering uh, is something that he, as I have said before, really doesn't understand and cannot understand because of the wisdom of God is deeper than the wisdom of men. Well, let's pray, and then we can start to to look at these verses together. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for another morning uh, when we can worship you. We thank you that you have given us the book of Job to understand a very basic, simple truth, and that is that you are God and we are man. And we do not come close to be able to understanding uh, the ways that you work in the world and the ways that you work in our lives. And God, uh, we may question the way that you work, but we pray that you had helped the book of Job to bring everything back into perspective and help us to realize that, that you're a good God, that you're in control of everything, that you're in control of even the things that we consider to be chaotic in the world. And help us to rest and trust in you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we look at God's relationship to animate creation, I think that we have to kind of bring ourselves uh, up to date historically and where we are uh, as people who live in America in relationship to the wilderness. Because when we look at the wilderness completely differently than the ancient world looked at it. When we look out in, in, at nature, we see vanishing species. We see habitat that is being destroyed and human beings encroaching on wildlife areas. And, and so wild places are harder and harder to find. And as a result of that, we look at the wilderness as something that's precious, something that should be treasured and protected. We set up wildlife sanctuaries and uh, animal reserves, I mean, uh, you know, places where we can treasure and keep the wild wild. Well, in the ancient world, everywhere was wild. Uh, You know, you could go out your front door and you were in the wilderness. And so uh, having contact with lions or wolves or bears was not something that you did when you went on a trip to Yosemite and looked at the bear digging in the trash can out of your car. Bears were real and alive and they threatened your life. They threatened your family. They threatened your livelihood as they, you know, raided the flocks of sheep and things that people depended upon. 
And so to the ancient people, the world seemed to be very, the wild world seems to be very uncontrollable and violent and dangerous. And from their perspective, it needed to be suppressed. It needed to be civilized. In fact, if you were to look at the way they believed in ancient Mesopotamia, they believed that kings and civilization was a gift from God. And it was a gift from God because civilization suppressed the wildness of nature, making it possible for humans to be able to live. And Egypt thought pretty much in the same way. They had land that they called black land, and they had land that they called red land. The black land was the land where the Nile River would overflow its banks, and the, the land was fertile, and they could farm there, and they could live there, and civilization could thrive there. But beyond that was the red land, the desert. And that was the place where they looked at as being dangerous, and they associated it with death and with, uh, with just evil that's in the world. So Job and his friends thought the same way as these different cultures did. And they believed that really the domestication of civilization and the subjugation of the natural world was really uh, the way that wisdom should work. But when we look at Job chapter 38, we realize that there's something quite different going on. The whole discussion in Job 38 shows that, you know, it's not just man-centered. Now, what I mean by that, I don't mean to say that somehow man's position is being made in the image of God and his command to subdue the earth and all that stuff has been taken away. I don't mean that. That is still there. However, God doesn't see the wilderness in the same way that we see the wilderness, at least the same way that they see the wilderness, as being something that's chaotic and violent and out of control. In fact, as we look through this, we're going to see that God views the wilderness as something that's dependent upon him It's something that he manages and something that he cares for. If you look at Job chapter 38, verses 25 to 27, this kind of puts it in a nutshell for us. We looked at this last week. It says, Who has cleft a channel for the flood or a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land without people, on a desert without a man in it, to satisfy the waste and desolate land, and to make the seeds of grass to sprout. In other words, this is a passage that talks about God's power, but it's also talking about the fact that God makes grass and seeds sprout in a land where there are no people. In other words, God isn't causing the grass to sprout for man. He's causing it to sustain the wildlife that is in the wilderness. He cares for and he manages the things that are in the wild and untamed and chaotic places. So God's intent here is going to be to show Job, not that he needs to repent of any specific sin, but but that he needs to begin to expand his thinking about God and the world and the way that God works within the world. And of course, uh, like I said, he's also going to have to come to the point where he recognizes that God isn't, isn't doing something unjustly within the world as well. So we're going to begin by reading chapter 38, verses 39 to 41, and it goes like this. It says, uh, Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? So, of course, uh, like I said, in that culture, uh, in our culture today, too, the lion is viewed as something to be dangerous, threatening. It was to be avoided or was even to be destroyed. Uh, that's really just the way that they viewed the lion. Uh, in chapter 4, verses 10 to 11, Eliphaz wishes that the lion would cease to exist. He says, lions may roar and growl, yet the teeth of the great lions are broken. The lion perishes for lack of food, and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. You know, now, he's making an analogy to people who exalt themselves and God tears down. But he uses the lion as an example. And he says, I wish that its teeth were broken in. I wish that it would die from the lack of prey and that the mother would be separated from its cubs. That's, that's the way they viewed the lion. Uh, the lion, of course, could also be used figuratively of something that was ferocious, like an army that was invading. In Numbers 23, 24, uh, it says, Behold, a people rises like a lioness. And as a lion, it lifts itself. It will not lie down until it devours its prey and drinks the blood of the slain. 
in Psalm 7, 1 and 2. It says, O Lord, my God, in you I have taken refuge. Save me from those who pursue me and deliver me. Or he will tear my soul like a lion, dragging me away while there is none to deliver. So again, from an ancient world perspective, the lion was something that should be destroyed and conquered and gotten rid of. Uh, it, it was something that wasn't tameable and wasn't part of civilization or part of man's idea of wisdom and order in the world. And yet God says, I'm the one who feeds the lion. I'm the one who provides for it. And so already Job now is beginning to be challenged in the way he views the world. In chapter 39, verse 1, he says, Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wilds. They leave and do not return. So man pretty much understands the habits of a domesticated animal and their breeding and gestation period and the birth of them. But the question here is related to animals who are far off in places that men cannot observe. And the point is, is that even though even these wild creatures that are far from civilization and far from man are able to survive because God watches over them. God knows when the deer is pregnant. God is the one who knows when it gives birth. <clears throat> and so God provides both for the predator and for the prey. God provides the food for the lion. He provides the protection for the prey, even in its most vulnerable times when it's pregnant and giving birth. The, the ibex or the wild mountain goat uh, doesn't need a shepherd to care for it and protect it from anything. It doesn't need civilization. It can live in the wild because God is there and God causes it to grow strong. And as a result of that, uh, civil, the animals can survive apart from civilization. So here you have uh, creatures that are living in what uh, the Egyptians would call the land of death. And they're thriving there. They live in this place that's uninhabitable by human beings. It's chaotic. It's untamed. It's uncivilized. But they thrive because God in his wisdom causes them to be able to thrive there. Now in the next verses, he moves to domesticated animals that have gotten free and gone back into the wild. He talks about the donkey and the ox. He says, who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied its, his ropes? I gave him the wasteland as his home, the salt flats as his habitat. He laughs at the commotion in the town. He does not hear a driver shout. He ranges the hills of it for his pasture and searches for every green thing. Now, of course, remember we talked about how humans valued the domestication of wildlife because they thought that that provided order to things, and it was a, it was a, a picture of wisdom. And yet God says, Hey, look at the donkey, the wild donkey. He looks at the town and he laughs. He looks at the, the, his uh, cousins in there being yelled at by people and pushed around. And he's glad that no one's bossing him around. He's happy to go roaming around in the hills and in the desert wasteland looking for food. He is perfectly content. He is perfectly fine doing what he's doing. And the same could be said of the ox as well. In verse 9, will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will he stay by your manger at night? Can you hold him to a furrow with the harness? Will he till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on him for his great strength? Will you leave your heavy work for him? Can you trust to bring him your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? And the answer to that, of course, is no, you can't. Because once the wild ox has become wild, it wants nothing to do with civilization. You see, there's another element of wisdom that exists outside of the wisdom of man, an element of wisdom that exists even within the chaos. You're never going to get an animal like an ox who has loved its freedom to show up and wait around by the manger and to serve you and to pull, pull a plow and make your furrows in the ground. You're never going to be able to use it, uh, harness its strength for the things that you want it to do because God has made it free. And God has given it the ability to be able to survive and enjoy life apart from man and apart from civilization. 
So the point is, in all of this, I think, is that Job's understanding of God in the world is too narrow. In other words, wisdom, as Job and the people in society looked at it back in those days, doesn't go far enough. The wisdom of God doesn't end in the civilization of man. The wisdom of God extends into the places that are chaotic and untamed. And I think that, of course, this would then apply to Job in that his life was viewed as being in chaos and everything was out of control. And God is saying it's not. Just look at the wild and look at the things that I have done there. In verses 13 to 18, uh, God talks about the ostrich. And this is important uh, because the ostrich is tied to its lack of wisdom. In verse 13, it says, The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, but they cannot compare their pinions to the feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that, they, uh, she cares not that her labor was in vain. For God did not endow her with wisdom or give, him, give her a share of good sense. Yet, when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. <laughs> you, know, this is, you look at these examples. To us, they're crazy. They're talking about ostrich laying its eggs and running around and doing stuff. But the point of this thing is, is that the ostrich, from our perspective, appears to have no wisdom at all. It lays its eggs in the sand on the ground in a place where somebody could trample on it. And from our perspective, it doesn't even care for its young. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't even care if it labored in vain in making the eggs and the, and the young ostrich that come up. It has no wisdom. And yet, God causes it to thrive and survive. And to anybody who is a sage in those days or a, a man of wisdom, he'd go, this is crazy. You need wisdom in order to survive in the world. And yet here now we have a, an ostrich, a bird, that appears to have no wisdom at all, and it seems to be doing just fine. Well, God's going to go on and he's going to talk about horses and birds of prey. <laughs> I'm not going to go and talk about all these things. But the point that he's making and is, and, and how is he answering Job's question is what we want to think about. Well, Job had viewed God as fitting in this box that anything that fell out of the box he considered to be chaotic or out of the norm or out of the realm of what God would do. He saw it as being arbitrary, of, as random, as unpredictable. And God's saying, Job, you understand so little about the world. You understand so little about inanimate creation. You understand so little about animate creation. And you don't understand that even the places that are chaotic and wild, I control, I manage, the inhabitants of those places are doing just fine. And so really, this was enough. This was all that Job needed to hear. In chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken, and I will not answer, even twice, and I will add nothing more. Well, you would think, wow, well, okay, this is all done. It's all good. You know, Job has now admitted that he doesn't know uh, everything that goes on in the world, that he's insignificant. He's going to close his mouth. But God isn't done with Job. In verses 7 and 8, he says, Gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? And really, that's now what God is going to address in chapters 40 and 41. Job was attempting to justify himself by condemning God. And so God in chapters 40 and 41 are going to talk about two creatures, the behemoth and Leviathan. And as you study this, you find that there are just tons of opinions on what these things are. Some people think that the behemoth is an elephant. Some people think that it's a hippo. 
Some people think that Leviathan is a crocodile or a shark or a whale. Some people think that they're dinosaurs. Some people think they represent the demonic. Some people think they represent evil powers within the world. Well, I'm not going to read all about the Leviathan and Behemoth, <laughs> so be glad for that. But uh, just my own opinion, I think that they are probably the hippo and a crocodile that's being described. However, because of their power and the fierce nature that they possess, they also become a visual picture of the world in hostility against God. And so as you read through the Bible, you find verses where they're, they're used in a figurative sort of way. And of course, even in Job, uh, they're spoken about in very figurative terms as well. But the point is, is that Job was trying to, to, to condemn God by justifying himself. And the point is that, is that, Job, if you cannot condemn and judge righteously behemoth and Leviathan, the strongest things that there are and the powers that they represent, you have no authority or you have no right to call into question the things that I'm doing and the suffering that you're experiencing. So Job had stepped over the line. It's one thing to try to justify yourself. It's another thing to try to do it by condemning God. So if God is going to be condemned as being unjust, then Job has to be in a superior position of righteousness to make that call. And God says, it isn't going to work. And he uses Leviathan and Behemoth as examples, how God uh, controls these things and is superior to Job in those ways, and Job isn't. Job chapter 42, verses 2 to 6. Job says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I, do not, I did not understand, Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you will instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. So finally, at the end of all of this, Job never got an answer as to why he was suffering but he got the answer that he, that he needed. He realized that God is beyond his ability to understand. And therefore, he said, what I have just heard before, now I see, I retract and I repent in ashes. Well, what do we learn from this? We should learn a lot. We should learn, first of all, that we know too little to be able to understand the hidden wisdom of God. God can even use creation just to show us how little we know about the world and the things that are around us. Secondly, we can look at the world and we can say, wow, this is out of control. This is out of control. Where is God in this? Where is God in that? Why isn't he doing this? Why isn't he doing this? But, but we got to realize that God is in control of everything in the world, even the things that are in the chaotic places, even the things that are in the, in the untamed wilderness that we would normally think were outside of God's control. And thirdly, we have to realize that we often put God in a box, and as soon as God does not fit in that box, we begin to accuse God of doing something wrong instead of realizing that the box that we have drawn is far too small to include God. Well, the book of Job teaches us that there are mysteries involved with sufferings. There are mysteries involved with trials. We may never understand why we have been dealt the, the, you know, the hand of cards that we've been dealt or why God is doing this or why God is doing that in our life. But the message of Job is you don't have to understand. You need to realize you're man, you're human. God is God. Let him be God. Live life for the glory of God. Live your life in accordance with his purposes on a day-to-day -day basis and you'll be good. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson that Job learned and has been passed down to us, that oftentimes, as the people in his society did, we erect ideas of what things are supposed to look like, and we create 
paradigms through which we look at our world. We have worldviews that tell us how you are supposed to act when in reality you are God. There is nothing that we understand completely about you. I pray that we would cling to those things that you have told us are true and that we would allow you to run your universe as you run it without opening our mouths and giving our input as often as we do. God, grow us into mature Christians and as people who understand the deep mystery and hidden wisdom of God at work in our lives and in the world. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Where you have gone, soon we will follow. Prepare a place for us. Until you come on clouds of glory, your spirit stays with us. Even through the storms of life, never will you we sing your love in the morning, your faithfulness in the night. God, you are God with us. My Savior ever surrounds me in all the seasons of life. God, you are God with us. God, you are God with us. Your grace extends beyond our vision through times of doubt and pain. So set our upon a mission as your word lights the way and even through the storms of life never will you leave our side we sing your love in the morning your faithfulness in the night God church let's end with the benediction um second corinthians 13 14 says the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all amen <laughs>